Oh, they had their flooding in. Hey, everybody, welcome. We're so excited to have you here. 20 people and counting. We're going to give it a couple minutes uh, just to get everybody set and, and ready and give them a chance to, to come in and, and we'll get started. Uh, we'll have a pretty active chat today. So feel free to, to jump into the chat and um, introduce yourself, where you're, where you're logging in from, um, and just how you're doing today. One, one word and, and how you're feeling always. Always gives us the the broad scope that we're that we're looking for. That as much as we're pulled together and and um, you know have similar experiences and, and find such an incredible unity and in, in coming together that everybody's experience is different on, on any given day. So we want to be here to support support people exactly where they are. So feel free to feel free to check in. Oh, this is just do we not everyone? There we go. It's back. I got to get my get my chat system happening here. Um, and we were excited. We've done this uh, session for four years uh, in a row now, and it is an amazing, amazing group of people. It's been, it's been such a joy for for me to see them um, just develop and grow, and and the unity that we've all had together is is something that's just incredible. And I know you'll see the synergy that comes between between our three panelists um, that I, I feel lucky enough to to call friends of mine. So we started in the beginning, I think, with the way that uh, intersectionality is truly a, um, you know, I guess when we started in the beginning, it was it was remote and satellite ERGs. And it was kind of this top down, right? That a lot of times at corporate headquarters, we have the, the backing and the support that we have these amazing ERG, specifically LGBTQ resources that exist. And then how do we translate that down, right? It was very much a, a top down. And, and, and now it's, it's so much more holistic, the viewpoint of it, right? That, that so many great ideas are coming from grassroots remote locations and, and how are we taking that into consideration in our inclusivity and and now as as work has evolved and we've gone virtual we've really taken into account um the the challenges that that has had with remote locations and and a lot of times that's maybe leveled the playing field a little bit and as we've continued to evolve as a panel and as a workshop now it's turned into really leveraging intersectionality and taking taking the dynamics of remote ERGs and BRGs and the relationship they have with corporate headquarters and the relationship they have um, kind of with one another. And then again, within our industry and, and this year we're going kind of broader kind of uh, across organizations. Um, how do we really use intersectionality um, to leverage ERG impact in the remote space? So uh, with that kind of lead up and, and a couple of minutes of an intro, I'm Ash Beckham. I'm going to be the the panel moderator, and, and again, it's it's my my joy to to see these folks every year and to be part of what we all do collectively together. Um, and we'll just go around. I'll let everybody introduce themselves, and and we'll get started. Um, feel free to shoot us any um, questions in the in the chat, and we'll either hold them off to the end or or address them um, as they come up. Uh, and any other housekeeping, um, feel free to enter that in in the chat as well. Uh, Ray, you want to get us started? Yeah, sure. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ray Stewart. I'm with the Boeing Company. My pronouns are she and her. Uh, my day job is supporting the, uh, the Air Launch Cruise Missile Program in a program uh, integration role and then supporting the Heath, Ohio leadership team in a site support role. My gay job, which is my fun job, is the enterprise president for BEPA. So in this role, I support the DNI organization with managing 22 different chapters of BEPA across the United States and internationally. And then I just want to mention, too, in my previous position at the company, I was the site DI leader for Heath, Ohio and Arden, Utah. And that's where I'm going to draw upon for my experience today uh, regarding the case study that we're going to talk about. Happy to be here. Thanks, Ash. Awesome. Of course, Ray. Um, all right, Will, now it's um, why don't you get started on the next one? Yeah, sure. Hey, Will Lewis, I'm thrilled to be here uh, with these folks again this year and even more excited to be with Ash. I've been looking at some of the comments in the chat. Ash probably can't see them in the in the summit uh, page tool, uh, but Ash, you have a fan club. Uh, like, like there are people that are here thrilled to be here and, and I feel honored to get a chance to talk to you quite a bit um, as, as we plan and prepare for this as well. Will Lewis with Experian, I am based in Chicago, um, but have had a chance to be at Summit for many years now in person and, and last year virtually. Thrilled to be here again this year and even more excited, hopefully, to learn from each one of you and each one of these panelists as well as we as we talk about ERGs and the power of them. But you're on mute.
Go ahead. Nope. I can't do both. Still I can't do both at the same time. Trying to do two things. All right, Kevin, how about how about you go uh, do an intro and then we'll get started. Sure. Uh, Kevin Bliley, I work for Procter and Gamble. Uh, I've been at PNG for 23 years, uh, so long time um, since I was in, you know, middle school, elementary school. Um, I, uh, my pronouns are he and him, uh, and I lead our um, ERG. We like to be different, so we call them affinity groups. Um, for LGBTQ+, plus, uh, we call it Gable. Um, there's a whole history as to why. Uh, also, similar to Ray, um, uh, globally, so we have chapters in uh, 46 countries around the world. Um, so I lead and facilitate that work for PNG. Too many windows open. Sorry. Um, all right, two chats. It's like it's I, I gotta I gotta brush up on my in my interactive virtual event space. Um, all right. So basically, what we're gonna talk about today. Um, is we're going to break it into a couple different sections. And what we thought was so important and what I think is so valuable about this group is not only their personal experience, but the diversity of organizations and the vantage points from which they see DEI, BRG expansion, and corporate headquarter influence. Uh, and then again, across different organizations. Uh, so we'll go through in the beginning and just cite some examples of how intersectionality um, has been leveraged within from their own viewpoint uh, within their own organization. So we're gonna start with Ray in Boeing and some site projects that, that they um, undertook that really was able to capture the, the impact that intersectionality uh, can, has had uh, both there and then has transcended um, just beyond the Heath location. All right, thanks Ash. So about four years ago, our um, site in Heath, Ohio, decided to take on a case study to see how we could drive intersectionality through employee engagement. So research had told us that people who didn't feel included when they came to work was about 60% less productive. So when you tie your employee engagement scores to those unproductive hours and then times that by your average labor rate, you can visually see the lost revenue uh, for the company and for your site. And this can be extremely alarming numbers. So. Our goal in the case study was to drive employee engagement through our business resource groups. And we had a couple focus areas for it. One of them was to emphasize the importance of being heard regardless of the position that you held in the company. And then the second one was putting the B, the business, back into the ERG. Um, at the time that we started this, I think we had about 30 people at the site who was actively engaged in the business resource groups. And our site has about 550 people um, at, it has about 550, but we're growing. Um, and so what we did was we developed and implemented a DEI program that was focused solely on the development opportunities. Um, essentially, it was building the full spectrum of, of project management skill set, but through the business resource groups, and we called it engaging the BRGs to improve the business. So we took these site projects that were normally handed over to like our senior leadership team or our um, uh, employee development program at the site to go work. And we gave these opportunities to our business resource groups to execute. Each of the teams um, got to pick their site projects. And then they negotiated with the leadership team um, as well as our finance team on how many hours that they thought it would take to execute that statement of work that was associated with the project. My job in all of this as the DNI leader was to manage them as a business resource group, but also as a project management role and to just ensure that they had the resources to do the job that they stayed within their budgets and just to be that voice um, to leadership and to get them any help that they might need to, you know, the support, the connection, et cetera. The cool thing about all this was that the BRGs were actually paid for any time that they spent on the project. So they were paid for any hours that they used to attend meetings if they were working on this, any hours that they, they spent on their, their project, um, even late in the evening if they were doing their planning and things. And then they were also provided a budget up to $10,000 per project to go work on. Now, keep in mind, the length of the project would depend upon the scope of the project. So some of them would take a few months and then others took a few years to, to, to accomplish. The only catch to, to this was that they had to be part of the business resource group in order to work that specific site project and to get that charge line. To be honest with me, uh, to be honest with you, you just you wouldn't believe the amount of people that signed up to join the business resource groups just to be part of the project, to be part of that movement or the initiative, um, you know, to have the opportunity to work on the assignment. Maybe it was something that they were passionate about, or even just to show, you know, showcase their leadership skills. 
<clears throat> some examples of the projects that we had varied from different things. We had a site coin where we're, a mili we're an old military base. So I don't know if you can see this, but this is an example of our BEPA coin. But one of the teams um, was able to design a new site coin for our site. Another team took on a, like a carnival for an all employee meeting. Our generation to generation group did a knowledge management and electronic library project. We had a Native American group that did an enhanced recycling program and they ended up saving the site thousands of dollars. <clears throat> we did a revamp on our new employee uh, orientation program uh, with one of our business resource groups. And then we assigned like a buddy program to every new employee that came in, a, a buddy to like a business resource group. And it was also a subject matter expert in their area to help them connect to the site and get acquainted. We rolled out tons of company initiatives um, through the business resource group projects like uh, the Boeing behaviors at the time. And then uh, like the Naval on Safety Project was another big thing. Our um, women's leadership group actually did a case study on whether or not we should move our entire site to like a 980 flexible work schedule or not. And then um, the last one I can think of was our veterans group. They actually, took on a project of sending veterans to all of our local career fairs that were veterans related to help with the recruitment efforts. So it was pretty cool. Uh, a lot of things that they really got engaged in and just you know took, took to. Um, overall, I would say that this was a huge win-win for everyone. The site had super engaged employees that were driving initiatives that really affected the whole site and the way that we did our business. We obtained perspectives of employees from the shop floor all the way to through management and and they were able to have their voice heard in decisions that were being made that really affected the business. Um, it helped develop our pipeline of talent of our diverse talent uh, being part of the business resource group you actually got to attend free project management courses. And it also provided them with like the experience hands on in terms of project management roles it drove collaboration and intersectionality across our business resource groups. Because not only did people join BRGs to be part of this, but the BRGs joined together to help, you know, coordinate and work on these projects. And then it drove visibility into our leadership team of many of the diverse talent that we had that maybe weren't getting noticed before. And then um, some results was just that we went from 30 people in our business resource groups to over 70% of our site being involved in some way or engaged in, in a business resource group. Um, I think at the end of the uh, assignment, we had about 402 people signed up participating or leading business resource groups. We drove DEI principles and understanding through the workforce while increasing employee engagement simply just by partnering people together with someone who's different from them through the business resource group and then accomplishing that a common goal. And then finally, we drove unintentional positive culture change through the site with our BRG intersectionality. So it's pretty cool experience. Um, it was definitely well worth the time and effort that we put into it and a lot of positive outcomes. That's awesome, Ray. Thank you so much. I loved it. There's su such great feedback in the in the Pathable chat that's happening. Um, and there was a couple questions, but I'll um, we'll hit those a little bit later. Kevin, do you want to move on? Kevin, you're going to focus more on from the corporate headquarters kind of higher level perspective and, and making it a sectionality of priority, leveraging it kind of the, the, the other way. Yep. And actually, um, I, I love the handoff from Ray to me because it's such a different example, but we, even just our group, you know, talking about what, what we were gonna share today, um, we've always thought of our affinity groups, our ERGs, BRGs, as a way to develop employees, but through the ERG BRG work, what I love about Boeing's example is having the BRGs solve other business problems that aren't necessarily just unique to that BRG. So it, 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 it's showing an inflection point going from a BRG or an ERG is just about solving the issues for that group to really trying to solve issues for everybody. Like I, I, I think that's such a cool a cool extension of, of what we've all developed at our organization. So, um, but anyway, as the segue to what Ash was saying, so every year we have um, in North America, an annual conference for our LGBTQ plus group, Gable. Um, we're, we're now doing them in other regions as well, but North America has been doing it for probably close to 20 years now. And so with the pandemic, we had to pivot to, um, to remote. 
you know, not bringing six or 700 people together. Um, but also last year in 2020, um, our conference is always in October. And that was right after, um, you know, all the uh, protests over George, George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, and really the, the whole Black Lives Matter movement. And so what we said is, well, we have an opportunity now because we're gonna be remote to really change what we're doing um, with that conference. And what we decided to do is take that intersectionality and put it on steroids. Um, so our event uh, in 2020 was actually bringing in um, Patrice Kalours, who's one of the co-founders of Black Lives Matter, and then um, David Johns, who's the executive director of the National Black Justice Coalition, both of whom also happen to be intersectionally tied into the LGBTQ plus community um, and have them speak to us and to all of our affinity groups about um, both what it's like to be black in America today, but also what it's like to be black and LGBTQ plus and for Patrice also um, identifying as female. And, and in addition to it being a great event, super educational event, and allowing us to practice intersectionality. I think the important learning we have is that so many more people in our re remote locations were able to participate in an event that they never would have been able to coordinate themselves. They never would have been able to afford the effort to do it. Um, they wouldn't have gotten the same high profile speakers. And so we were, happy and proud about the event that we were able to do it, but it's also given us these key learnings of going forward, how do we make sure that we are scaling those events that we're doing corporately so that people from remote locations can participate in them, that we are partnering with our other affinity groups, our other ERGs, BRGs, to make sure that we are uh, addressing, commenting on, driving discussions about what is the big topic, what are the big things that we're working on right now, collectively intersectional, intersectionally, um, allocating resources in a different way so that everybody can benefit from them. And then that accessibility, both you know remote and also um, recording the session, not just having it be live. Um, and it's something that we're now reapplying um, for our upcoming session here in a couple of weeks. Um, to again, continue intersectionality, but also that ability to participate uh, remotely and not have to travel or not miss out on the event completely. Um, so that's, uh, that's the example I wanted to share. I love that, Kevin. Do you think you'll ever go back? You think P&G will always offer a virtual component at this point moving forward? Like, can you not put the toothpaste back in the tube, whether for budget reasons or other reasons is it like the broader the message the better or do you think you'll eventually like where do you think you land on that i think like most things the answer is going to be hybrid um but i think what we we all now have experienced is that you have to be intentional about being hybrid it can't be we're all going to be in person and we'll have a speaker phone so you can listen you know, if you want to, and there's rustling of papers and people t t talking over each other in that. And from my vantage point, this is actually, it was almost opportune, you know, what's that change lemons into lemonade. I've been trying to figure out how to get our groups that are doing these conferences. And we now have them in North America, Latin America, Europe, and uh, Asia, APAC. I had always been pushing for having them be recorded. I think really this everybody working remote has allowed us to say, it's better if we can have people participate, even if, it, even if that's remote. And so we had been starting to go there. And I think this is so true about remote engagement it is that you know the pandemic in the last year and a half has forced us to figure out the things that we should have been figuring out anyway. And so now okay. th this year we're still doing virtual because we haven't, as a company, we haven't gone back to large group meetings again. I'm hoping in 22 that we're going to have some people in person and we're real and we're going to figure out how to keep some of these, um, this ability to scale and 
accessibility and not make everybody travel. Um, now, what's funny is right before we all joined in, so our group was in the green room, we talked about how there is, there is though a benefit of people being in person. You get those informal connections, you get those hallway conversations, you get networking. That's why I think it has to be hybrid, but we have to remember what it feels like to participate in an event remotely so that we don't become the people in the room versus the people on the phone. And that's true across everything that we're doing, not just for our ERGs, BRGs, but it's almost even more important, especially when you get into groups that are a relatively small percentage of the population, because we have sites where there might only be one or two or three out people. They're never gonna be able to put on an event themselves. They might be able to get funding to attend an event once every two or three years. So if we don't find a way to intentionally have these this ability to connect remotely, they're going to have benefited in, you know, 2020 and 2021, and then 2022 they'll lose out on that again. And and, and we can't let that happen. Um, and I challenge everybody. I'm assuming most people are in a similar position. I would challenge everybody to really think about how do you keep that remote connection and make them really part of it, not just the person on the phone. Right, yeah, I think that's just like the inclusivity lens just continues on, right? Like for for a variety of reasons, we were forced into that, but some people will always be in that remote space. And so how are we making, we think about who we're leaving out, right? Who are we forgetting? That's awesome. Um, all right, Will, you wanna jump in next? You have such a unique perspective moving between organizations, knowing the job market is hot. There are so many people that are, that are moving either within uh, a job description that involves DEI or moving to a different organization and taking in kind of the context of that organization and, and really leveraging your experience uh, and, and making an impact and making change in the, in the new organization. So jump in and, and take off on that. Yeah, no, thanks so much, Ash. You know, it's been, it's been quite the year and a half or so for all of us, hasn't it, right? As we've all learned different ways of interacting, how do we reach out and connect with people in person versus remote? And then imagine you're doing that and on top of it all, you decide to change organizations. For many folks, myself included, you change organizations having never met anyone in person, right? And you think about the way that most of us grew up, the way most of us were socialized back in school or however you were educated um, is in person, right? Reading those social cues, understanding how fit, frankly, whether we like it or not, we all make judgments every day based on those in-person social interactions. I don't like it here. I don't enjoy the vibe here. This is great. This person's really warm and exciting. And then all of a sudden we're relegated to this 2D experience. Well, for me, you know, and, and I'll, I wanna talk a bit more in, shortly about how great um, our Pride ERG and all of our ERGs are what they're doing, but I wanna just shift between organizations I'll start at. Um, for me, I made that change from one organization to another, an organization I've been at for quite some time, a wonderful place. Um, but I built relationships in person over the course of many years. Then I came to an organization where you didn't meet anybody. How do you do that, right? How do you connect? I think it really kind of takes this remote and satellite locations to an entirely different extreme. And for me, it was interesting. We've been talking about satellite locations and ERGs for a bit. Um, and all of a sudden, everyone's satellite. <laughs> um, some parts makes it easier when everyone's satellite because we're all living through the same experience, except when you get to that point where you're trying to figure out how do you actually uh, chart your path and what do you do? And what I, what I determined, and this is a lesson that I think we'll pick over to ERGs as well. I'm sure some of our listeners have changed organizations over the past year and a half as well. The first thing was we have the option to either sit inside of our home or wherever you're working from and say, gosh, this is me and my little silo. I'm going to log on at this time and log off at that time and just do my work. But the truth is, the way many of us, including those of us that are leading ERGs, have been successful is by building relationships, by connecting with people and inspiring others to be able to participate and volunteer their time. For me, my personal case study is I had to be far more deliberate than maybe some things that happened organically in the past. Uh, were when joining a different organization. When I joined Experian, I didn't, my first day wasn't in office. It was actually in this seat that I'm sitting in right here a year ago. Um, and I had to be deliberate about whom do I reach out to? How do I connect with them? 
asking appropriate questions and also taking down some of those borders. You know, I think many of us were probably socialized to say, um, I'm only, you know, this person's a certain level, I can't talk to them. Or this, you know, or that person, oh no, that person's off limits for me and my role. Um, and really what this environment has done, I think is humanized us all in a way where we realize everyone should be a part of. I saw in the, in the pathable chat a second ago, someone was asking a question around, how do I find dollars or money for it? How do I prove the ROI of some of the ERG programs as a part of that? And I think one of those things is through what I'm talking about right now and being deliberate about building relationships. So the first pointer I would say is be deliberate about building relationships, reach out to individuals that you may think are untouchable, which you'll find is most people are willing to talk and engage um, and connect you with other people as a part of it. Find out for whatever work it is you're doing within your ERG, identify others who will be advocates, right? Sometimes an advocate is not just in providing dollars or a purse string. Oftentimes advocates are people that will grease the skids, so to speak, or open the path for the good work to happen or to proliferate throughout the organization. So the second thing I'd offer for me was being willing to have conversations that may seem like they just don't fit um, as a part of it all. And then this third thing for, that's been helpful for me in joining a different organization during this time of, of remote now hybrid work um, has been being open to those five minute conversations. You all know, it's like you used to stop by the water cooler or in the elevator lobby or whatever it is and you'd have a conversation. Um, but now you get that ping that says got five. Well, the response shouldn't be, well, I have 30 minutes two weeks from now um, at 3.30 in the afternoon where we can talk. Figure out five minutes when that meeting ends early and literally spend, because that, that's really that same amount of time you would have spent when you were walking down to the restroom in the hallway and you would just stop and, and have a quick chat with someone. That, that all, of, all of those little things come as a part of it. And here's the last thing. I think this is really, really important um, to, to folks that are passionate about this, this work that we're all doing around being queer or LGBT plus is be okay with talking about yourself. For me, that's been a journey for me as well, right? I came, I was introduced into the workforce where there was a time when work was work, home was home. You didn't really talk about your family, your kids, your partner. You didn't do any of that, right? This is work. And what we've learned through all this is we welcomed people into our homes. Right now, you're in all of our homes, right? As we welcome people into our homes, you all have done the same that are listening to it, is feel free to um, be authentic. Part of being your authentic self is not only, uh, you know, sharing your share, sharing who, how, how you express your gender, um, but also it could be a part of, oh, that's my dog that just barked in the background. Yeah, I have a dog. You know, <laughs> let me show you a picture of him. Yeah, he's making noise. A mailman just walked by, or a male person uh, just walked by, right? As as a as a part of it. So for me, it actually it really has been trying to be deliberate about my approach and then making connections that are really authentic and genuine. And sometimes it does mean being unapologetic about um, how you express yourself, um, and, but being, being comfortable in your own skin as a part of it. It's an interesting yeah, time. Yeah, that's, it's so fascinating because it feels like, especially when you're in an organization, as long as you're with Bank of America, those are gradual relationships that you built, right? Over time, over water coolers, things that happened over the years. And then you're in this new organization and you don't want to move backwards, right? So you're almost, you're, you're coming out as an intersectional ally from the jump, right? Whether that's because that's your title or that's your passion. And so how do you kind of navigate in, a, in an organization that has just inevitably a different cult culture, not better or worse, that where you're, what is your, you know, you, I feel like so much we're hungry to make an impact, but we also have to understand the nuance of an organization and, and just how have you started to, to, to navigate to navigate that and maybe give yourself a little bit of grace knowing that it doesn't change overnight, right? That you still need to build those relationships. Yeah, that, that, that's exactly it. Like for, for, for me, it's really been the willingness and openness to, to listen and learn, right? Because we all come into situations with our own biases and our own experiences and our own perspectives. But when you join a new organization, it's, a, it's an entire, and especially for me, I was at Bank of America for, for nearly 15 years. 
Um, um, and after being at an organization for that long, you kind of become ingrained and 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 the company and who it is. And you like you know that person from their first day many many years ago. You all develop a relationship over that time. You've seen their kids graduate and them get and them get married and so on. You come to an organization, you don't have kind of that or that organic language, if you will, that 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 you're speaking. For me, it was taking a moment and not coming in with a whole slew of opinions and perspectives around how it should be being done, but instead really taking that time to listen and learn along the way. I'm still learning, by the way, right? Um, and, and listening along the way. And then there's this, there's this bit that um, recognizing that everyone else was learning along the way as well. I've been really proud watching our uh, Pride ERG here at Experian because one of the things that they have done, I think really flawlessly, is spent time um, being deliberate about how they're delivering their programming, right? And so Ray and, and Kevin talked a little bit about um, this hybrid version where some people are in the office, some people are in video. So they've been thinking very deliberately about that. And then also, how do they integrate uh, it into the work they're doing? They've done it by um, somehow sometimes blending events across different chapters from different cities, right? And so there was a time when you do maybe a dual event with the, the Black ERG along with the Pride ERG in the city of Austin, maybe. Um, but what this, what this new world has done is says the Austin ERG can partner with the London ERG along with the LA ERG, and you all can all do an event together um, as, as a part of it. And, and I, find, I find that really helpful to me because when I go join it, it gives me a flavor of the company across the board um, as, as a part of it. And our Pride ERG has done that. And, and they've also figured out how to measure their impact, not only by attendance, but then by the actions individuals take after it as well. There's been this really robust chat and teams that we've had throughout this week about an equal where everyone is attending. We have quite the contingent that's attending. Um, and they've all been sharing some of the lessons that they're learning as well. So it's using technology in a different way so it doesn't just end at the water cooler. It's actually a benefit of being virtual, right? So we're able, people are openly sharing their perspectives and what they're with their learning, but also admiring some of the things that our ERG has been able to do, like influence our benefits policies over the years, right? And then sharing that with others, because what we're finding is sometimes there are policies that we have that we didn't know about. So I'm listening and learning to some extent, and others jumping in as well. I'll give you an example. Earlier this week, there was this dialogue coming out of one of the sessions around gender reassignment surgery, and oh, our we experience should offer that. And someone else chimed in and said, well, actually, Experian does offer that. I've been a benefactor of, of, of the surgery. Let me tell you, you know, and so that education bit, because I'm listening um, and the rest of the team is as well, we're all kind of learning. I think that goes a long way. Kevin, I saw you were about to jump in. Yeah, it, it was more kind of building off because as you were talking, I, I hadn't had a chance yet to look through all the questions in the that were coming through the chat because we got the Zoom chat and the other chat. Um, are, are you okay, both Will and Ash, if I just poke at a few things that people asked from, from my section? Yeah, absolutely. Of course, just one thing real quick. If anybody, um, uh, we just got a couple things in the chat about turning on um, closed caption. Um, oh, yeah. And I don't know if I have the access to do that. Mary Lou, if you're still on, if you could just um, direct message me and let me know, or if you have access to turn it on, we should have a couple of requests for the closed caption to be turned on. I'm going to do a little bit of research on that, but want to jump in before Kevin and, and, and flag that, but yeah, go ahead, have, have at So I read, I skimmed through them, so I, I'm not going to answer every question, but the three that jumped out of me, um, people asked about how do you, how do you have events that are remote or that you can join remotely um, when you've got people, people mentioned international, they mentioned more conservative areas, and they mentioned when a lot of people work from home. And I would argue the hybrid event, or at least right now, completely remote event, helps with all of those. Um, you know, because if you are in a more conservative site, so we have manufacturing sites all over the country, all over the world, the ability to call into an event that exposes you to the, the types of topics we're able to, you get linked into those things that that again, even even if you had the budget, even if you had the support at the site to do an event like that, if you're in a more conservative area, it's gonna be a lot harder to do. 
that's the same with international. So I was able to, without flying on a 24 hour flight, I was able to participate in some of the events that were being held in, in Asia, um, in Europe, either real time, actually calling in their time or watching some of the things recorded. Um, so it was international. It was, and then it was the people working from home. E even if you can get, you know, geographically 15 people that are working from home into one location, um, that could be a way to do a hybrid. So the hybrid is you've got a remote group of people that come together, but the other one is allowing all 15 of those people to participate 100% remotely, um, you know, from wherever they're sitting. Um, so I, I think I hit on the big ones I saw kind of floating through the questions. Awesome, that's great. Um, and then Ray, I think there were just a couple uh, for you specifically from the beginning. Um, mostly about securing the funding and the hours for the work, like was management on board with that? Um, how did you quantify it? Like, were you able to, um, you know, measure it and, and uh, maybe highlight the, the impact that it had? Like, what did that look like kind of year over year to, or I guess the first year you've done it, uh, just to be able to, to trace it and define that impact and secure the funding in, in future years or use that data to, to convince um, management to to broaden it out, so just a, just a quick recap on funding, if you can. Yeah, the funding. I mean, like I said, the I think I said it in the chat that the leadership team actually came up with the idea to do this and to fund it. So instead of having like the employee engagement and the um, um, the d different programs that we had put in place to you know to spend all this type of indirect funding on they wanted to reinvest it into the business and so that's why we decided to invest it into the business resource groups so um, like i said typically in the past we would have our employee development program our senior leaders lead these type of projects um, as development opportunities but when we pulled the business resource groups and we, we tend to gain more traction and more people got involved in it so that's awesome. And then just real quick, Ray, will you just look and see if you have um, live transcript as an option at the bottom? I think you logged in first, so I think you might be the main host for closed caption, but we'll kind of continue continue on that. Um, so the, the next uh, topic we were going to kind of we were going to address um, is the creativity, creatively solving solutions. Um, so challenges that, that, that have been faced, um, again, with this intersectional lens and how either local um, or specific corporate ERG BRGs have addressed that, and there's just some, just to highlight, just a, a handful from from each of you. I know several of you you have them, but um, Ray, you want to kick it off and just hit on a couple uh, of the ones that that Boeing has has done. Um, again, just different ways to different lenses that you've used, or depending on where you sit, things that you can can get done um, in creative ways to to solve problems. Uh, uh, maybe kind of an end around, right? Like you kind of thinking of your your final result and where you want to get and maybe the line from A to B isn't isn't straight, but you still get there. And, and what is what does that look like? Yeah, sure. So um, when I think about challenges that I face and solutions that I found in making change at Boeing, I would really have to point to three examples from our BEPA business resource group, which is our Boeing Employee Pride Alliance. Um, so for BEPA, it's all about creating impact that's really bigger than just like signing some document and um, really just creating that change without those bold political statements. So one of the challenges that we faced as a group when we took on these leadership roles was the visibility and the branding of the LGBTQ community, uh, especially during like Pride Month. So our BEPA eBoard accepted this as a challenge and we changed the way that we advertised in order to create that impact. So the goal of, the pro of this was to really address the gaps and to, to connect those chapters in the business resource groups across the enterprise. We implemented several cool ideas to drive visibility across the company. Um, one of them, Ryan Dewey, which is on our BEPA leadership team, he developed a, a pride clothing line from the Boeing store. And he advertised the clothing on social media outlets and through all of our business resource group networks. And then another one of our members um, actually worked with our Boeing branding and created the, Web at back, the WebEx background that you see that I'm using today to use for Pride Month. And then with all the meetings being virtually, it was pretty cool because it was impactful. You were seeing people from all over the organization, not just with BEPA using this background. So another challenge that we had was for obtaining permission to fly the rainbow flag during Pride Month. A lot of our sites are located on military bases and installations and it just runs into some problems. 
So our eboard partnered with our Jedi organization and we were able to purchase these huge rainbow banners, um, diversity and inclusion banners that were rainbow. And we were able to put them at every factory floor and every building across the um, United States. We even sent our banners you know, internationally. And then one huge initiative that our BEPA team took over this year was trying to find a way to drive intersectionality as well as allyship across the company, specifically targeting the production floor where you find a, a lot more cases of uh, what I would say harassment or discrimination, or even just more people who aren't comfortable being out at work. And so we did this through the development of our ally program. We had a, it was more of a partnership program uh, with several organizations, several pieces of our organization. And uh, we had four major focus areas. One of them was to partner with our learning organization to develop a degree pathway, which is essentially like a LGBTQ learning module. It was the first LGBTQ training that we had implemented across the company. The second was a partnership with our leadership to purchase these cool ally safety glasses for our production floor employees, uh, purple signifying allyship for the community. And as I'm sure all of you know, Boeing's huge on safety. So we were able to tie our vision into something that was important to the entire company. And then we had the implementation of our Ally of the Year Awards where every BEPA chapter was encouraged to submit a nomination for a BEPA Ally of the Year. And then um, my VP for the BEPA leadership team, he put on a leadership day, a BEPA leadership day this past Tuesday. And during that leadership day, um, uh, company executives came on and then down selected and announced the ally of the year winner in which that person will be promoted to the 2022 Audi awards for out equal so it's pretty cool and then we're currently undergoing a partnership with management to develop the ally management council which is essentially open to all managers across the company the goal is to drive bepa initiatives around like recruiting retention just being a better ally mentorship um, some peer-to-peer -peer education on topics like employee transitions or LGBTQ talent and LGBTQ benefits. Essentially, it's just managers making things better for our community by just connecting with other managers and, and through those lived experiences. So all of these are just a few examples of some of the things that our BEPA leadership team's doing to drive you know, significant change in the culture. It's all about having impact without the RAA. So I guess, you know, essentially, I guess I would just say that I consider us a very cohesive BRG network that really drives change by levering, leveraging intersectionality for influence. That's great. Those are such such great examples. And I think once you kind of start down that path, again, then that becomes the norm, right? You kind of establish that as the bar. And when you have any subset of ERGs reaching out in that way and making that impact, people are jumping on board, whether that's other local ERGs, kind of the mentality of that uh, moving forward as a, as a common group in, in need and want of allyship and development and support, I think be, then that becomes the standard expectation. And I think that kind of goes, uh, Kevin, into, into something that you were gonna share around the, um, the flags and, and kind of how one, one ERG really launched a pathway for multiple ERGs to be able to uh, have some exposure in a new way. And we're in a little bit different situation than what Ray was talking about with, you know, flying the pride flag, being on a military installation. Um, but, you know, every big corporation has their their rules. Um, so this is a specific example, but I think it can be uh, blown up to be to be a more applicable to everybody. So in front of our headquarters in Cincinnati, Ohio, there's something like 40 flagpoles. And we're active in 70 some countries around the world. And every month they rotate the flags and they put a new country in, take a country off. So for years we've been pushing during Pride Month to be able to have one of those flagpoles have the Pride flag on it. And this is one of those we, you know, we got to treat everybody the same, which annoys all of us who work in this space. Um, and they're like, we've got to keep, you know, that's our process. We've got all the country flags, we rotate the country flags. So we tried for years, got frustrated, and just weren't able to do it until finally we have two buildings with a bridge that goes over a main street in Cincinnati that has these big, big glass windows. And um, a brand, one of our brands had put a couple of those window clings up on the uh, on the window. Um, and so one of our, our members was walking through and they're like, huh. So they went to the person that manages the building and said, hey, I saw you have these window clings up for whatever brand it was. 
um, could we put something up during Pride Month? And the guy was like, sure, I don't see why not. I mean, we put it up for the brand, why not? Um, so we ended up with this enormous rainbow flag on this bridge going across a main street in Cincinnati when we couldn't get a flag up on this flagpole that would have been tiny because they're so, you know, they're huge, um, made much more of an impact. And then actually that has now become the norm for all of our groups during their month, they use some sort of window cling that goes up into that, into that crosswalk. So it's one of those, like, um, you'll hear people call it the third way, you know, this is what I want to do. This is what the rule says. What's that third way to get something accomplished? And then how do you share that with uh, the other, your other ERGs, your other BRGs? We have a similar one where the, um, our people with disabilities group came to us and said, you know, we're working on bathroom accessibility. And we said, that's great because we also want to be working on, um, you know, gender neutral bathrooms. And so we were able to go together to the people who manage our facilities and say, we need a plan as you're renovating, as you're sprucing up changing so that the bathrooms are both accessible and, and gender neutral. Um, and so it allowed us to go together instead of each one of us kind of fighting the fight on our own, you know, versus saying, no, no, we need this for a lot of reasons, you know, and then it became a, and every bathroom should also have a, uh, um, uh, if, if they're accessible to the public should have a, uh, you know, a baby changing station. So now people may or may not have seen Pampers has gone, one of our brands has gone um, very much into getting uh, bath or uh, baby changing stations into both male identified and female identified bathrooms. So it's like, how do you get that, those ideas that you can then scale across affinity groups and, and, now, now it has become the norm. Both of those have become the norm. Every time we renovate a, a restroom facility, they're looking to make it accessible and, and, um, and gender neutral. And now we've done at our headquarters that big flag across the bridge. And so now all of our other satellite sites are like, well, they're doing it in Cincinnati. We should be able to do it here too, so. I think that's such a, oh, go ahead, go ahead, Will. Sorry. Yeah, if, if I can, you, you know, I, I love, I love those examples. That's, that's, those are such great examples. And one of the things that Experian did is take advantage of the time during the pandemic where our offices were closed um, and we were changing spaces, renovating spaces, things like that. We started introducing as a standard um, gender neutral restrooms throughout the organization. It was like, if we're going to, to your point, Kevin, if we're going to be renovating, why not make that a standard? So now it's just instead of kind of being an afterthought or trying to convert something into another, um, make it, it's now a standard that something we take advantage of. But Ray, these props, you, you, you're doing it with these props. I'm like, you pulling up coins and glasses. And I'm like, oh, we slip in here. We not, <laughs> right? I mean, I like it. I love it. Uh, but it, it brought up a, a really tangible example of um, one of the things some of my colleagues did that I think really helped spread the word of the work around Pride. During Pride Month, uh, a few months back in June, they sent our CEO kind of a swag bag, right? That, that included a, a mug and things like that. And what started happening is our CEO would go to meetings and he would, at the beginning of the meeting before he would start, whomever was in the meeting, it could be three people or 50 people, he would hold up his mug, had nothing to do with ERGs, right? He could be talking about the, the results, the fiscal results. He'd hold up his mug and say, do you know this is Pride Month and the Pride ERG sent me this mug and I'm, I'm so, you know, and I use it every day. And he talked about how important it was to him. He would do that before he got into whatever the purpose of the meeting was. And it became this really organic way that no one asked him to do. They just kind of sent him a swag bag and he started doing. And, and I thought, as I was seeing your swag, uh, Ray, um, uh, come up. First of all, I felt kind of bad that I don't have any props here. But secondly, <laughs> but, but secondly, gosh, if you can, if, I'm thinking a suggestion for all of us is if we can send those swag bags to some senior executives with influence in our organizations, and they just kind of naturally start using them in places that they had nothing to do with ERGs, what a powerful way to kind of push our message forward. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. Right. Sometimes you just need the you need the tools and and. I feel like the thing that pulls us all together is impact, right? Um, there's like kind of the standard way of, you know, how you think things happen, what the rules say, how do we get in? And we think that the win is being one of, right? Being one of the flags that are represented. But when we take that broader scope and we think of the impact that we have 
again, beyond Kevin, just it's like the greater Cincinnati community. If you're not going to PNG, you're not going to see the one rainbow flag. But if you're driving down the highway, you're going to see where PNG stands relative to that. Same thing with the safety goggles. Like people might not even know, like the they just might be not standard safety goggles, right? And then they're purple and they're fabulous. And then you know what it is and it starts the conversation in the same way what you're saying, Will, is it, it gives people a tool to start the conversation. And that's so many times what we're looking for is just that connection, just that need for the CEO to be able to uh, verbalize in, in whatever way, right? It makes him comfortable speaking about those topics. It, it normalizes it and takes the awkwardness away from it if that's something that the CEO can do in a meeting that has nothing to do. It's the same thing we've said, right? Like it's not, ERGs are not a HR issue, right? It's a company-wide issue. And I think by pulling everything together that everybody has said, it really speaks to, um, speaks to again, the impact that we can have and, and how we we're forced to think out, outside of the box and, and think of the impacts that, that we can have. And, and that's kind of our end game, right? Is, is how, how broad it can be. And it doesn't have to be corporate taking a stance on some sort of issue, right? If, if the way that we can have the most impact within our organization and across the community is something that's never been done before, let's figure out how we can do that instead. So it's those, those viewpoints tie, are just so valuable. And just to tie it back into the intersectionality topic and the remote, um, it was funny how, you know, there, a little bit of that competition between Will and Ray, like Ray showed all her swag and Will was like, hey, I wanna show mine too. We've seen the same thing because um, we call LGBTQ plus one of our invisible diversities. Sure. We have a lot of visible diversities. The visible diversities have been doing work in the space, but in a different way. And we've started to try and, I don't know, coach and mentor each other. And one of the things we've talked about is these, we always had to have visible symbols, the swag, the rainbows, the stickers, the the badge cards, all that kind of stuff. And now we've, as we've been partnering with some of the other groups, we've said, you really should have that as well. So now it's almost like not a competition, but a, we should have more visible symbols for, um, you know, our African ancestry group for our people with disabilities. And so we're trying to, to have those be things that are, they don't have to be the same, but they, they should be similar across the different groups. That we're, we're all trying to drive education, visibility, discussion, you know, having that mug and having a discussion, you know, it'd be great if the CEO every month starts meetings by saying, and this month is this because I have the mug now. <laughs> and next month, now we're talking about this because I have the mug now. Um, so I, I think a, a, a huge benefit of this sharing across and, and we're learning things from from some of the other groups and they're learning things from us how do we keep that those discussions going and when we talk about vis visible diversity sometimes that can kind of narrow the scope of what allyship looks like and so it really gives you the ability to state in that way what your where your allyship lies and, and what your responsibility is to highlight those and and that um, ability and desire and responsibility to lift people up, right? To know, hey, we figured this out, this is a great thing. You know, my first call is to my ERG to say, hey, look at this amazing thing we did. My second call is to all the other ERG presidents to say, this yep. is, look what we just came up with, how do we do this together, right? How are we move, working collectively in that way? And we, we do have a phrase that we came up with several years ago. Um, sticks in people's heads sometimes it's say it show it do it so when we have senior leaders ask us questions when we have allies ask us like how do we be more we say say it show it do it so say the words like you need to be comfortable saying lgbtq plus lesbian gay bisexual transgender whatever you know african ancestry black depending on you know what the uh, what people want uh, what words people want to be, use say it show it is those visuals all that swag and do it is, you know, come to events, uh, offer to speak, especially for senior leaders, allies, it's be part of the conversation. Um, and that's true across all of our ERGs. You know, the allies and senior leaders are asking, what should we do? Say it, show it, do it. You gotta use the words, you gotta show the symbols and you've gotta show up. 
And I think another, uh, just an intersectionality piece, and one of the questions uh, just I saw that Craig just brought up, um, and Ray touched on this a little bit, maybe each of you can, are those um, nonverbal cues, not being in person, the ability to show that allyship. So whether that's your WebEx background, email signatures to me are just a fascinating way to show allyship and promote education with a link that explains it that's really succinct, right? That, that anybody can add that and anybody has the access to be able to do that and to be able to speak those words and have those conversations. Because I think, again, that's just another way of, of allowing people to educate themselves, but then knowing I'm an ally, I'm a resource to have that conversation with, I think is so critical. So anything that you could, any of you could touch on in, in those ways of nonverbal cues that, um, that you've seen either in a remote environment or as we go back that, that have been impactful or, or beneficial or must haves in those spaces. Yeah, yeah I can share, go ahead. I was just going to share real quick and then I'll let you jump in. Um, one of the things that we do at Boeing, you know, right now it's, um, we're still like d different history months at the bottom of our tagline, you know, the Jedi organization sends out, you know, a learning moment and a tagline. And then anyone across the company can change it to that. So, you know, for right now I'm helping the, the Hispanic organization with, with my tagline and my email. I think you probably saw that when I sent that email to you last night. Their ash. So it's pretty cool that they do that. And then other groups, you know, during Pride Month put in our tagline in the bottom of their email. So that's a pretty cool thing that we do. Go ahead, Will. Sorry about that. No, no, I, those are awesome. And I'll just add two in there as well. One of the things we've done is for different days of understanding or Pride Month, for example, we have our Teams background. So we use Microsoft Teams and uh, we have backgrounds. But we don't just have one, we have like several, right? So people can choose an option that fits best with their personality as well. And we also offer those backgrounds in different languages, right? So English, Portuguese, Spanish as well. Um, so people can do it in whatever audience it is that they interact with the most, which we think is really great. And then just recently, one of my colleagues uh, within the past week or two sent me a note pointing out to me um, that our CFO for North America has also has added his preferred pronouns to his email footer as well. Having such a, seat, a senior level sweet seat person do it sent positive ripples throughout throughout the uh, 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 the pride organization and throughout the company. Right, is one of those leadership kind of tactics. If a leader is doing it, it normalizes it, and and, and I think that's kind of one of those outward ways expressions, if you will. Yeah, absolutely. I think that I think those are all great examples. And again, I think such a key piece of that is that that CEO or the high level executive is putting themselves out there to have that conversation. But we also have the ability, I think sometimes when people are hesitant or or unsure if, if that's something that they want to do, having the links and the the verbiage that explains it within the context of HR resources that exist within the organization that is just very succinct. Um, this is how it fits into our overall mission statement and our goals and objectives, right? Like this is why this is important. And here's the, you know, quick brief version of the who, the what, the why, the where, the how, right? Like how, how you're just answering the questions. And then if you want to have a more in-depth conversation, but I think it really gives people the opportunity. It's that bridge to allyship that you just sometimes need some knowledge and you're too, um, you don't want to ask for fear of looking, um, not as forward thinking or as progressive as you want to be in that space. And, and so again, I think self-education is such a critical piece and giving the, you know, making that one click away being like, Oh, he just did that. Let me click on that and see what that is. Like, obviously I, I gauge him as straight, white, cisgendered, right? Like that wouldn't be obvious. Why would he need to do that anyway? That kind of launch pad for, for education, I think is just so, so critical. Well, we're bumping up on time. I think we can, it automatically stops 10 minutes after and we will certainly stick around for for questions but um if each of you just want to have um maybe one one takeaway or one one challenge what, or one thing that you're currently working on just kind of like a, a a parting thought in this space kind of as it continues obviously this is no finish line we continue to to move forward but something maybe you're you're working on um, moving forward that's, uh, that excites you, I think is always super inspiring. And then I'll, I'll keep an eye on the questions and, and bring those up at the end. So go ahead, Ray, you wanna kick us off? Ray, you wanna go first? Oh, that's okay if you don't, if Kevin, you can go too, whatever. I can't, yeah, I don't know if Ray's having a, a mic I know, 
Yeah, um, no problem. Go ahead, Kevin. One of the ones, because it came up a few times that we're always trying to balance is, um, and, and I think this whole discussion of intersectionality and remote locations comes into play is every region, every country, every site is for us is in a slightly different place on the journey. And so what we're always trying to figure out is how do we offer the right content, the right tools, the right um, access to those content and tools for, for groups that are on a different place on that journey. Um, you know, so it could be legal cultural environment that's outside of our facility, or it could be that facility itself hasn't done as much work in the in the um, E and I space, DE and I space. So that that's one thing that we're always challenged on, and we're trying to figure out. And I think this thinking remotely, thinking hybrid, and thinking intersectional allows for people to pick and choose what they need at the time that they need it. Yeah, absolutely. I love that, Ray. It looks like on mine, it looks like you're off. You want to give it a shot? Uh, it keeps kind of tweaking a little bit. Go ahead, Will. Yeah, uh, I'll leave us with um, integrating diversity, equity, and inclusion and the work of LGBTQ individuals throughout our entire ecosystem is work of consequence. And all that we do, we should think about this beyond HR. Think about this beyond ERGs. How do we ensure that our product suite directly focuses on issues of diversity? How do we ensure that as we're going to market, as we're thinking through things at the, from the point of inception, uh, that that's a part of it? To me, if we think about diversity, equity, inclusion, and we think about the work um, of LGBTQ plus individuals, we should think about this in a couple of different tranches, certainly around talent and being sure that, that we have, we're represented in the workplace. Um, we should also be thinking about it on how we do business, whatever our product is, whatever our business is, being sure that this is a ribbon that, that pulls through it all, and then ensure that we continue doing things in the community, not just that those few people that you see every time, all of us uh, should, should, should have that in it as a part of it. This is work of consequence. I hope all of you lean in and, 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 and bring someone else along with you. Yeah, that's huge, right? And, and I think, again, like I think a little bit about what both of you have said really gives us um, the idea that we've really been forced in the last 18 months to look at flexibility and individuality and individual needs and kind of meeting people where they are in is something as simple as access to work, right? And schedules and things like that. And I think, although that's a more challenged way to look at things pro professionally, it also allows us that that idea that no team, no affinity group, uh, no marginalized group is a monolith. And, and those individual needs are just so critical. And, and now we have the opportunity to, you know, for Kevin previously, either you came to the Gable meeting or you didn't, right? And there was kind of no in between. And there were probably people that were there on the fence, whether that was the budget or time or commitments or whatever. And, and now we have this accessibility that we can kind of meet people where they are and always encourage that constant up leveling that we all want to have, but we have the, you know, since, since things have kind of blown up and we're rebuilding them, we need to rebuild in the way that we want to be rebuilt and the way that's most inclusive and, you know, on, online of what Will said of just really being able to, um, wherever people are in that journey, we're here with you and here's where we're going, jump on, right? There's always, there's always room on the bandwagon wherever you are, we want you exactly as you are. Cause if we're, if we want inclusive and we want a sense of belonging, that means everybody, right? And so how do we make sure as leaders that that's what we're doing? Um, and that becomes a priority of our initiatives. And, and again, to always be analytical of who are we forgetting, who are we missing? How do we get them here, right? And and what and that's that's on us and on our lens, right? It's nobody's responsibility to say they're forgotten, right? Because we're going to miss people that way. So, um, Ray, you want to give it one more shot? No, that's all right. Yeah, no problem. Um, well, we are all uh, thrilled that you were part of this. We hope you have an amazing um, rest of your summit. All of us are accessible on the app if you want to. Um, uh, if you want to stay in touch with us, if you have any continuing um, questions or things we didn't get to, I will uh, 
put my email in the um, Pathable chat if anybody wants to reach out to me directly and I can put you in touch with um, our wonderful panelists. But um, happy summit. Don't forget National Coming Out Day is, um, is Monday. And although that's morphed over the years, I think it's an opportunity to come out as an ally um, of other groups, just a, a general, be more authentic version of, uh, of yourself. So props to everybody who's here. Uh, we, we loved having you. And Looking so forward, fingers crossed, to being in person next year. Thanks to the Out and Equal folks. Thanks to Mary Lou for taking such good care of us and getting us to fix our names. And Will got his plant. Like, thanks for keeping us in line, Mary Lou. It was amazing. Um, gratitude to the three of you, as, as always. Love you and, and can't wait to chat again soon. Bye, everybody.